Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. It's Nursing Ed KGS Keithian here with another video. So in today's lesson, we're going to take a look at acid-base disorders. We'll delve into this complex world of acid-base disorders and we're going to examine how these imbalances disrupt the body's equilibrium and affect well-being. What happens when balance is disrupted? From conditions like respiratory acidosis to metabolic alkalosis, acid base disorders can arise due to various factors. And so it is important as a nurse or a nursing student that you have a very good understanding of acid base balance in medical practice. We're going to take a look at some causes, symptoms, and treatments. And this video will really help to reinforce your skills and give you a better grasp of the complexities of acid-base balance. Welcome to Navigating Acid-Base Disorders, a Nurse's Guide to Balance. There are certain questions that we ought to ask ourselves when we are trying to interpret these delicate imbalances. One, is the pH normal? Is the PaCO2 out of range? Is the bicarb out of range? And then you'll associate the abnormal result with the pH. You'll also ask yourself, does the PaCO2 or the base go in the opposite direction of the pH? You'll also take into account the PaO2 and oxygen saturation and determine if these are normal. Reference ranges often seen on lab reports will provide the normal values for various blood components, including your pH, your PaCO2, and bicarb levels. And these ranges act as a benchmark when it is that we are assessing a patient's acid base status. Each component will have its own reference range. For example, pH would normally fall between 7.35 to 7.45, and then your PaCO2 should fall between 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, and then your bicarb, 22 to 28 milliequivalents per liter. And it's very important that we know these reference ranges so we are able to identify deviations from the normal and know when it is that the patient will need interventions. There are factors that will influence these ranges. For example, age, underlying health conditions, and even medications can impact these values. And as such, it is important that you have a thorough patient history to help to get an accurate interpretation. Right, we'll also compare their current values to normal range, so we're able to identify trends and sudden shifts that might alert the nurse that the patient needs immediate attention. These ranges are fundamental to interpret acid base disorders accurately. And I also want to point out that depending on the lab that the test is carried out, the reference range will be different. So not only take a look at the blood results, but take a look at the reference ranges that are used in that particular lab. We'll also talk about compensation whenever we're talking about acid-base disorders. Compensation will always happen from the opposite system. Compensation is the body's natural mechanism to counteract an acid-base imbalance and restore a more normal pH. It's the body's way of trying to bring things back into harmony. For example, in a respiratory acidosis, there is an excess of carbon dioxide. The kidneys kick in and they try to retain bicarbonate, which helps to buffer the excess acid. On the other hand, in respiratory alkalosis, there's too little carbon dioxide. And so what the kidneys do is that they excrete bicarbonate and this helps to decrease alkalinity can also talk about metabolic acidosis, where the lungs will compensate by increasing the receptory rate in order to blow off more carbon dioxide. And then if the patient is having metabolic alkalosis, that respiratory rate decreases in order to retain more carbon dioxide, which helps to balance the excess bicarbonate.
It's quite fascinating and it's very important that as nurses we're able to recognize signs of compensation in our patients. Simple rule is that if the pH is normal, then you have full compensation. And in full compensation, the body has successfully restored the pH to a normal level. But, and pay attention to this, one of the primary causes of the acid-base imbalance remains. In other words, while the compensator mechanism manages to bring the pH back into the normal range, the underlying issue leading to the imbalance will persist. And you'll be able to see an example of this as the lesson progresses. Uncompensated acid-base disorders occur when the body's compensator mechanisms are unable to bring the pH back into the normal range. In these uncompensated situations, the primary disorder is not fully offset and the pH remains outside the normal range. Compensation will always occur from the opposite system. So if your respiratory system is the main cause, compensation will come from the metabolic system. So if the PaCO2 or the bicarb is normal, and if one's normal, the other one should be out of range. And then there's also partial compensation, which occurs when the body's compensator mechanisms attempt to counteract the primary acid base disorder, but the pH does not fully return to normal. In partial compensation, the compensator response is evident, but the original problem persists to an extent. Now, if you notice in this graph, the PaCO2 should be between 35 to 45 and then your bicarb somewhere between 22 to about 26 then you have your pH and here is 7.0 and then this is 7.8 and then you have 7.4 so there should be a line that comes down here and then this would be where your ranges have been normal and then you'll also be able to take a look at the compensator response in this graph. Well, there are times when you'll be asked for patients who are having some kind of acid basis orders, what is the patient's anion gap? So the anion gap is a valuable tool in the assessment of acid basis orders and particularly in cases of metabolic acidosis. It is calculated as a parameter that helps to identify the unmeasured ions in the serum and these provide insights into potential causes of acidosis. It is calculated from the concentration of measured cations, so your sodium and your potassium and your measured anions, your chloride and your bicarb in your blood. And the formula is shown below. The anion gap helps us to diagnose and categorize metabolic acidosis and it represents the unmeasured anions in the blood such as lactate, ketones, sulfates. A high anion gap suggests the presence of additional acids that may be contributing to the acidosis. So we'll be calculating the anion gap when metabolic acidosis is particularly identified. A normal anion gap ranges somewhere between 10 to 15. A high anion gap, so above 15, indicates an increase in unmeasured anions, and this may point to conditions like diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, or renal failure. A low anion gap, on the other hand, so less than 10, may indicate conditions like hypoalbuminia, multiple myeloma, where there is a decrease in unmeasured anions. Identifying the cause of metabolic acidosis through the anion gap is very important for targeted and effective treatment. And this helps the patient to have better patient outcome 
better interventions. So it's a very important tool when we are trying to understand and manage acid-base disorders. So we'll just take a look at this table and we'll also use this table when we're looking at examples. So A will represent acid and then B, base. If your pH is less than 7.35, that means the direction is more towards the acid side. Then if it's greater than 7.45, then the direction is towards the base or alkalotic side. Now, if your pHCO2 is less than 35, that is towards the base side. If it's greater, then that's towards the acid side. And then for your bicarb, if it's less than 22, then that's towards your acid side. And then if it's greater than 28, then that's towards your base. And there are times when I'll just write out upper fab and I'll plug my values in. So we'll show you an example after this one. So in our first example, we have a pH of 7.58 and a PaCO2 of 76 and bicarb of 32. Just by looking at these values, you realize that all three values are abnormal. And it is partially compensated if all three values are abnormal. So our pH of 7.58 is going in the direction of base. The PaCO2 of 76 is going in the direction of acid. And then our bicarb of 32 is in the direction of base. So the bicarb corresponds with the pH. So we know we're having some metabolic issue. The PaCO2 is elevated because there is some kind of compensation going on where the respiratory system decreases ventilation in order to retain carbon dioxide. And that is evident by the high PaCO2 level. The pH is abnormal, so compensation is partial. And in this first example, we are having partially compensated metabolic alkalosis. In our second example, we have a pH of 7.58, a pHCO2 of 31, and a bicarb of 24. Now, if we plug these values into the table, we realize that the pH is alkaline or PaCO2 is also alkaline. And then we have a bicarb that is normal. Now, you'll see patients come in who may be hyperventilating or they're having fever or severe anemia where there is excessive loss of carbon dioxide, which leads to increased alkalinity. And the pH is above normal range. The bicarb is within normal range. And so I realize that there's no compensation going on in this example. And we are having uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. Third example, we have a pH of 7.12, so we know that's acidic. Then we have a PaCO2 of 55, that is also an acidic value. And then a bicarb of 38, which is alkaline, right, or base. Now, when we plug these values into our table, we realize that our PaCO2 corresponds to our pH. So we know we're having a respiratory problem. And then we know it's acidosis. And then because our bicarb is out of range, we understand that it is uncompensated, right? Now, what is happening is that there is retention of carbon dioxide leading to increased acidity and the kidneys have attempted to retain bicarbonate right however the ph remains above normal range 
the bicarbonate levels are elevated. So we know that we're having partially compensated respiratory acidosis. And just looking at these values again, you realize that all three values are abnormal. So the compensation will be partial, just to reinforce that. So in this fourth example, we have a pH of 7.43. It is normal, but it's more towards the alkaline direction. Then our PaCO2 of 29, also abnormal, and it is also towards your alkaline direction. Then our bicarb of 20, also abnormal, but it is more towards your acidic direction. The PaCO2 corresponds with that pH. So we know we are having a respiratory problem and there is compensation from the kidneys because the HCO3 or bicarb is abnormal. In this example, the pH is normal, so compensation is full. And the answer for this one is fully compensated respiratory alkalosis. In our fifth example, we have a pH of 7.25, so we know that's towards your acidic direction. Then our PaCO2 is 40, that is normal, and then our bicarb of 15. Our bicarbonate corresponds to our pH, so we know we're having a metabolic issue and we know it will be metabolic acidosis. There is no compensation going on because our PaCO2 is in normal range and our pH is still below normal range. Now in this example, what is happening is that there is excessive production or inadequate removal of acids leading to that increased acidity. The answer for this is uncompensated metabolic acidosis. In our sixth example, we have a pH of 7.19, abnormal, a PaCO2 of 33, also abnormal, and a bicarb of 14. Now remember, if all three values are abnormal, compensation is partial. So our pH of 7.19 is towards the acidic direction. Then our PaCO2 of 33 is towards the alkaline direction. And then our bicarb is towards the acidic direction. Our bicarb corresponds with our pH. So we know we're having a metabolic acidosis issue and there is partial compensation and we can think about it because there is excessive production or inadequate removal of acids which leads to increased acidity now what our respiratory system is trying to do is that it has increased ventilation in order to blow off co2 and so that's how that low co2 level come in the pH remains below normal range, but the CO2 levels are also decreased. The partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Example seven, we have a pH of 7.32. Abnormal, it's below normal range, and it's towards your acidic direction. Then our PaCO2 is 61, very elevated also towards your acidic direction and then you have a bicarb of 27 that is within normal range now remember it is uncompensated if the PaCO2 or bicarb is normal and the other is abnormal and we can clearly see that in this case now what is happening is that there is retention of carbon dioxide which leads to increased acidity there is no compensation from the kidneys 
and our pH remains below the normal range. So the answer is uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Example 8, we have a pH of 7.18, a PaCO2 of 58, and a bicarb of 37. Now, all three values are abnormal, so compensation is partial. Our pH is towards the acidic direction, our PaCO2 is also towards the acidic direction, then our bicarb is towards the base direction. So in this case, we're having partially compensated respiratory acidosis. There is retention of carbon dioxide, which leads to increased acidity, and the kidneys have attempted to retain bicarbonate in order to buffer that elevated PaCO2. The pH remains below the normal range, but the bicarbonate levels remain elevated because they are trying to compensate. So partially compensated respiratory acidosis. In example 9, we have a pH of 7.59, which is alkaline because it's above your normal range. And then we have a PaCO2 of 29. This is below the normal range and it will be also towards your base side. And then our bicarb is below the normal range and it is acidic. Now, the PaCO2 corresponds with your pH, so you know you're having some respiratory alkalosis problem going on. All three values are abnormal, so you know there is partial compensation. So there is excessive loss of carbon dioxide, which leads to increased alkalinity. The kidneys have attempted to excrete bicarbonate. Now, the pH remains above normal range. The bicarbonate levels have decreased because the kidneys are excreting bicarbonate. So what we're having here is partially compensated respiratory alkalosis. In example 10, we have a pH of 7.65, that is an alkaline pH, and then we have a PaCO2 of 44, it's about normal, and then a bicarb of 21, which is acidic. Now, this is one of those questions or lab results where you would need a redraw or revalidate because this would be a mixed acid base imbalance or a complex acid base imbalance because the pH is alkalosis. However, the CO2 and the HCO3 are moving in opposite direction. And this can happen sometimes when there's equal or more than two primary disturbances. So this is a hypothetical blood result that would have been taken on a patient who may have alcohol liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension. An arterial blood gas sample was collected and the results are below. A pH of 7.22, which is acidic, a PaCO2 of 46, elevated, also acidic, and then a bicarb, of 18.8, also acidic. They were intubated and mechanically ventilated on 70%, and then their blood oxygen saturation was 97.3. The potassium was 3.6, so it's about normal, and then their chlorine was slightly elevated and lactate within normal range. This is another example of a mixed acid-base blood gas. And when you do see results like this, redraw 
but also know that for patients who do have mixed acid base blood gas results or disorders that they are very sick so let's look at this next example a venous blood gas sample was done on a patient who would have come into the emergency department feeling unwell. Now, I mentioned at the start that they are a hemodialysis patient, right? So initially when they came at 12, a VBG was done. The pH was 7.73. And if you'll notice, the reference range is used in this lab is different right so always look at your reference ranges for the lab that the test was conducted in then we have a paco2 of 20 and the bicarb is normal it's 28 so the ph is very elevated it's towards the alkalosis side and then the paco2 is below normal range towards the base side so we have uncompensated respiratory alkalosis and of course it's uncompensated because the opposite or the other value in this case the hco3 is normal right and the other the paco2 remains abnormal now it was repeated at 1500 the pH at this time was 7.67. The PaCO2 was 24. So it was trending up. It's going in the right direction. And the bicarb hasn't changed. So it's still uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. And for patients who do present with respiratory alkalosis, some of the symptoms that you will see is that they are lethargic, confused, you know they'll complain that they are lightheaded sometimes they'll have nausea vomiting high heart rate or tachycardia sometimes lower normal blood pressure hypokalemia so you'll also look at their potassium and you notice that it may be low they can go on to have seizures and you'll also notice that their breathing is deep rapid breathing or they are hyperventilating in severe cases, the patient can also go on to have tetany, and they may also complain about tingling of their hands, feet, and the perioral area. Now, with some of the causes when it comes to patients with respiratory alkalosis, it could be that they are having anxiety, it could be that they're having a pulmonary embolism, or sometimes there are patients who are mechanically ventilated, sometimes end up having respiratory alkalosis. Now at 1700, a VBG was repeated. The pH is trending again in the right direction. It's now 7.64. The PaCO2 is trending towards normal. So it's now 26. And then the bicarb is 29 it has increased however it is still within normal range so we still have this patient that has uncompensated respiratory alkalosis now when you're trying to treat specifically respiratory alkalosis you try to treat the underlying cause if it is that they are hyperventilating at the and it is secondary to anxiety you can ask them to breathe into a paper bag. The primary problem in respiratory alkalosis is that there is excessive loss of carbon dioxide, which happens if it is that you are hyperventilating, and this leads to increased alkalinity. Now, on the normal circumstance, what should happen is that the kidneys attempt to excrete bicarbonate right in order to compensate however this patient the as i mentioned before they are a hemodialysis patient which means that in order to get rid of anything in their body they need to be on dialysis and this is why even though at 2000 the vbg was, was repeated and their ph is you know it's trending in the right direction it's now 
3. The PaCO2 is now 30. So it's trending towards normal. However, however these values are still towards base, right? Elevated pH base below normal PaCO2, also base. As I said, under normal circumstance, what should happen is that the HCO3 or the bicarb level should decrease because the kidneys should attempt to excrete bicarbonate. But this patient kidney does not. It's like it's just not working properly, right? So instead of excreting, it's holding on to that bicarb, right? So it's now 31. Now, by the morning when this was repeated, so the next day, 6, six o'clock, it was repeated, and their pH has gone down, right? So it is now within normal range, 7.42. Their carbon dioxide PaCO2 is now 49. Now, according to this reference range, that's a normal PaCO2. The bicarb is increasing. This patient needs to be dialyzed. Now, the problem was that the facility, of course, didn't do dialysis. So they ended up being transferred out. So what we have now is that the patient is going to go into where what we mentioned before, a combined acid-base um, imbalance, where now we have two primary causes so what's going to happen now is that they are going to be having in addition to the respiratory alkalosis that they were having now they're going to be having metabolic alkalosis as well because the body has been holding on to more of that bicarb because the kidney just has not been able to excrete the bicarbonate so we have come to the end of the video and I hope these examples made a difference in your learning and you're able to you know, challenge and attempt to analyze these acid-based imbalances that you will encounter in practice. Now explore some real life scenarios and I hope these helped you to better interpret, assess, and understand these acid-base imbalances. By asking the right questions, considering compensation, and understanding reference ranges, you will be well-equipped to provide exceptional care. I hope you found this lesson helpful. And if so, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with someone else. Stay tuned for more interesting topics in healthcare, and I hope it is that I was able to make your educational journey a little bit better.